Welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building a new nation. I am Adinghor. With us for the show is a man with a long and distinguished CV, Dr. Francis Mading Deng. Dr. Deng has recently served as South Sudan's first ambassador to the United Nations, as well as former special advisor for internally displaced peoples and genocide prevention for two UN Secretary Generals. As an academic, Dr. Deng has authored or edited over 20 books in the fields of law, conflict resolution, forced migration, human rights, history, and politics, as well as two novels. His idea for fixing South Sudan, sovereignty as responsibility. It's a pleasure to have him one-on-one. -on -one. Dr. Deng, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Your thesis, Sovereignty as Responsibility, was adopted in 2005 by the UN General Assembly as a principle that they would put into action. It has become responsibility to protect. What is sovereignty as responsibility as you envision it? And then we will talk about um, how it has been perceived over time. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to your program. Uh, I would approach this subject in several ways. Uh, first, as you suggested, uh, we go to the origin of the concept, and then how I applied it in my various mandates in the United Nations. And finally, we may relate it to our own situation here in the country. When I left the government service, uh, as you may know, I used to be Ambassador and Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of Sudan. When I left, I went back to the United States and joined a number of think tanks. One of these was the Brookings Institution, where I was asked to develop an Africa program. What I did then in developing a conceptual framework for the program was to ask myself and my colleagues, what are the critical areas of concern in Africa that lend themselves to serious research, scholarly work, that can be translated to policy and acted upon. Four priority areas jump to mind immediately. Conflict resolution or management, human rights protection, governance, and development. We then focused on conflict management or resolution. And the question I asked at the time this was towards the end of the 1980s. As the Cold War was coming to an end, what would be the implication of the end of the Cold War on how we perceive conflicts and therefore how we manage them or resolve them? Now, those of you who are old enough will recall that during the Cold War, all conflicts virtually, internal and regional, were perceived as proxy wars of the superpowers. As the Cold War was ending, uh, the superpowers would withdraw, their strategic concerns would withdraw. That meant that dependency on the superpowers in interpreting what the conflicts was and also how to manage and resolve the conflicts would disappear. Strategic concerns would no longer be the basis. So we had to reapportion, first of all, understand the conflicts in their proper perspective as internal or regional. So the Cold War ended and now you were writing after the Cold War, so it means now you were dealing with sovereign African governments. The Cold War was ending, ending. and we were preparing ourselves for the impact of the end of the Cold War. So it had not entirely ended, but was approaching to end. This was late 1980s. Now. It was a positive thing to see the problems in their proper context, not distort them as proxy wars. 
but it also meant that responsibility had to be reapportioned. So that instead of depending on the superpowers, countries concerned and the sub-regions and regional organizations would then have to assume responsibility for managing their own conflicts. Now, since they were withdrawing, we had to assume the responsibility. Uh, and then, if the state could not manage its own situation, it would resort to the regional or sub-regional organizations to assist. We then conducted a series of studies which were regional and also country specific. And those included uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Botswana, Sudan, Ethiopia. And we then had more or less a, a thematic concluding uh, country specific ones, uh, which synthesized all these regional and sub-regional uh, and country specific studies. And after a series of publications, books on different themes and different country situations, we had a volume called Sovereignty as Responsibility. This volume dealt with the normative principles, which means the basic policy issues concerned, and then dealt with the basic issues in conflict and how to manage them and who was to manage them or resolve them. Now, shortly after that, I was appointed to be special representative of the Secretary General on internally displaced persons. So in approaching it, my interpretation then in approaching the president, the minister's concern was sovereignty, obviously this issue, internal displacement, falls under your sovereignty. I respect your sovereignty, but I do not see it negatively as a barrier against international involvement. I see sovereignty, and this comes to your point, I see sovereignty as a positive concept of state responsibility for protecting its own people. And that had di different aspects. Protecting them physically from harm, from danger, from war, conflicts, protecting their human rights, protecting them by providing them with their essential services, uh, life-saving services, and it means, therefore, that you, as a sovereign state, have the primary responsibility to protect your people. My role here is to have the international community assist you. If you fail to protect your people because you need help, call on the international community to assist you. If, on the other hand, you fail to protect your people, you fail to call on the international community, the international community is not going to sit and watch, especially given the fact that human rights and humanitarian concerns are the critical basis for international relations following the end of the Cold War. So there was, that was a basic approach. Right, that was the theory, and then now you had a chance to explain it and in your own unique way. Did it work? You know, there's a difference between saying to a government, you are violating human rights, you are disrespecting humanitarian values, we will intervene and we will override your sovereignty. That's a negative way of threatening a government. To say that this is an internal matter which falls under your sovereignty, and I respect your sovereignty, but I don't see it negatively, I see it positively. And we are here to help you discharge your responsibilities of sovereignty. That was more acceptable. It was not threatening. It made the government realize that you care about their people. You are there to help them do what is essentially their responsibility. That was how for 12 years I managed to deal with governments on the issue of internal displacement. My mandate was said to be only one year. When they were relatively happy with what I was doing, they extended to two years and then every three years until a law that was introduced limited terms so that after the 12 years I could no longer be uh, renewed. I would like to understand what motivated you to come up with the idea. Was it a sense that uh, uh, these uh, emerging states were mostly failing and that 
you felt the need that they would, uh, they, they would uh, uh, turn to the international community for assistance. And that was a difficult subject to explain. What, what was your motivation? Well, the point was that many of these situations are internal. Even conflicts are internal. And the concept of state sovereignty is fundamental to the international system. So the question was, how do you engage governments? If you threaten that you would violate their sovereignty in the interest of protecting their people, you would be resisted. There is no way the government is going to happily invite you to come and interfere with their sovereignty. So my approach was how to recast sovereignty in a manner that would lay foundation for international cooperation and partnership. Therefore, it was a practical way of dealing with what was then and continues to be a very sensitive issue, the issue of sovereignty of the state. This is what this idea means in practice, and some people have criticized it. Uh, they have said that it's almost colonial in the sense that if uh, there is this sense that the states will fail, and if they fail, they have to turn somewhere else, and that is the international community. In most cases, these are former colonial powers. So how do you address that? Well, you said earlier that this concept has now been recast as sovereign, as the responsibility to protect. And it was based, and this has been documented in a number of studies and publications, it was based on the original idea that we presented of sovereignty as responsibility. The difference is the 2005 uh, summit that recast this concept into the responsibility to protect, the World Summit. The difference is that it is now being seen, I think wrongly, by most people, as a threat of the international community to intervene to protect people. Now, sovereignty as responsibility and the responsibility to protect both rest on three pillars. State responsibility, support for the state to discharge its national responsibility. And as a third pillar, if the state is unable to discharge that responsibility and does not call on the international community, then the international community will use several other measures, which include, of course, diplomatic intercession, sanctions, and ultimately, as a last resort, military action. Now, the problem is military action is a very, very difficult idea to apply partly because it's costly. And very few countries are willing to throw in their young people into harm's way and risk getting killed. And so the conditions that might necessitate intervention militarily are either the country you are intervening has collapsed in terms there's no authority, and so you just go into a vacuum, or the government is so weak that there can be no resistance, in which case you overwhelm it easily, or your national interests are so high that it is worth risking through intervention. Now, we know the good case, the example rather, of Rwanda. The international community pulled out when people were killed and genocide was committed. Since then, the world has become more sensitive about possibilities of genocide. Right. What is the difference between the idea as you envisage it and how it is being applied? Where is the difference? Is I it, is it still, in the explanation? I think there's still a tension between those who believe that when states do not discharge their responsibility, the international community is called upon to intervene. This either or is simplistic in the real world. And as I have said in a number of situations, we have to balance idealism with realism. Idealism may dictate that in a utopian way, when governments do not discharge their responsibility, we come marching in and overturn the system and help the people. That doesn't happen easily. That's extremely difficult. What is more practical and pragmatic is this notion of sovereignty as responsibility, calling on governments for their own legitimacy internally and externally to work hard to try to protect their people. When they cannot, call on the international community to join them, 
to do what is really their responsibility. But in this day and age of concern with human rights and humanitarian issues, you are not going to be left alone if your people are suffering and dying and you don't help them, you don't stop the crisis, you don't call on the world to come and join hands with you and people are dying, there will be ways and means of the international community meddling with your sovereignty. It's a good place uh, to take a break and then we'll continue it from there. Good, pleasure. Welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Madingor. Do you have a vision for South Sudan? Do you have what it takes to build a just and cohesive South Sudanese society? What is your idea for fixing the nation? Join me for one-on-one -on -one interview. Let's debate about who we are and who we shall become. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Madingor. With us, Dr. Francis Madingde, a renowned scholar and a diplomat. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Before the break, you were talking about the fact that in this day and age, when government, uh, when governments are not effective enough, there is a high likelihood that the international community will intervene. And let me just point out that the responsibility to protect, as it is, has been used uh, to invade countries such as Libya. Uh, it has been invoked uh, by the Allies when they in invaded uh, Libya. And in often terms, it is being seen as controversial. So uh, tell us what is the responsibility of the international community and whether your original idea is being applied wrongly. You know, what this idea has done, if you shift it from sovereignty as responsibility and you focus on the responsibility to protect, which, as I said, is being misperceived as a threat of intervention when in fact it has three pillars. And intervention is the very last resort, which as I say, is extremely difficult. And something that, except for extreme circumstances, people want to avoid. Now, there's still a dilemma. And this is a dilemma I've been quite closely associated with. I was one of the resource people that helped guide the OAU into the, a into the AU. And one of the critical provisions we were dealing with was this question of intervention. And there was a strong feeling that sovereignty still reigns supreme and should be respected. And yet there was a feeling, not just a feeling, a conviction that we have to do better when countries fail to discharge their responsibilities and there's a great deal of suffering and death. The international community, the AU, has to do something, has to intervene. That tension is still there. My view is that intervention as such, especially military intervention, is not only extremely costly, even for those intervening, but is almost certain to be resisted. And therefore, I think most people have to find a more practical, pragmatic way by co-opting the threat of intervention into partnership, which means I, as a representative of a country that has serious problems and where there's a threat of intervention, I welcome the fact that people are concerned about my people, about the suffering of my people. But I let them know it is wrong to think that you care more about my people than I do. I care about my people. But if you also care about my people, let us join hands. Let us work together to solve the problem. I may want to help my people, but I have limited capacity. And the limited capacity calls for international partnership. There is still that tension, that dilemma. I still think I would err on the side of partnership rather than the threat of intervention. And the partnership that you talk about is a partnership between a host government and the international community, which sometimes have ulterior motives. So how do you make sense of that? Well, you then have to be creative, you have to be alert, you have to scrutinize, you have to know foes from uh, friends. Unfortunately, if we become too 
suspicious of everybody and we become confrontational with the outside world, the question then is, instead of co-opting those outsiders to enhance our capacity to respond, it becomes a relationship of antagonism, uh, which frankly does not serve the people we want to serve. In other words, if you want to intervene militarily, the country concerned will not welcome you. Okay? People will continue to suffer and die. If you, on the other hand, resist external support, your people will also continue to suffer and die. And therefore, I believe strongly in two things. I believe that in crisis, there are opportunities. And I believe that optimism, if it is not blind, is a necessary condition for action. Pessimism leads to a dead end. What all this means is I look to the outside world and see who is motivated to really want to help us. Genuinely. Genuinely. And work with them. If I detect, if I can prove that somebody is motivated by ulterior motives that have no interest of my country in mind, then of course I will resist that. But one has to be creative in knowing who is a foe, who is an enemy. I need to say in this respect, I followed very closely the path leading to Southern Sudanese independence. Going back to the days of the IGAD initiative, and I was one of the resource people that worked very closely with the IGAD partners. Initially, the IGAD countries, then partners, forum, and ultimately the Troika. It was not an easy process because becoming independent or having self-determination that could lead to independence was a very controversial topic. Even towards the end, by 2010, it was still highly controversial. I debated in great length and in depth tensions with the leadership of the AU, even the leadership of the UN, about the fear that independence of the South would send a wrong signal to Africa, uh, South Sudan could become a failed state and crisis. And of course, many of us argued using Abel Alir's subtitle to his book, Two Men Agreements Dishonored. If we dishonor this agreement, there will never be any agreement between North and South. Then, so I just want to say, 2010, there was an about turn. And the United States, working with the Secretary General, led the international community into recognizing the right of self-determination being exercised in time and the will of the people of South Sudan being respected. I'm saying this to say the world suddenly became very receptive, very positive attitude, goodwill towards South Sudan. Now things began to happen that, are created, uh, that have created tensions and conflicts between us and the international community. We have to be careful to see to it that we continue to win the cooperation of the international community and not forget that these were friends and we can still make them friends. The responsibility to protect uh, has been solidified by the fact that uh, there is this feeling of never again after Rwanda, after Bosnia. And so it is a popular idea in the international arena. So what would you say uh, as the originator of the idea, which, which aspect of the idea are you proud of? What, what, what has it done positively that you are proud of? First of all, every time we say never again, and then it happens, and once again we say never again, each time we say never again, the level of guilt rises, shame rises. The world was ashamed by the way they responded to Rwanda. And the world has since been trying to do something about that. The commander, Delaire of Canada, who was there when genocide took place, and he tried to confront the international community, was not supported. Some troops pulled out. I think Ghana stayed on. He himself violated the UN instructions to leave. He has been severely hurt by that experience, physically hurt by it, psychologically hurt by it. Since then, it is now believed that the specific commander, the force commander, has some latitude to react. 
to react in a manner that is more responsive, more responsive to the situation. Not only that, the mandates of the United Nations have since then increased the capacity of peacekeeping of, uh, forces as well as their mandates to prevent atrocities and genocide. It is still a struggle because, again, genocidal conflicts still happen around the world, and the world is not absolutely equipped to prevent them. But to me, the only practical way to go forward is to consider, to continue to foster cooperation. Confrontation simply adds fuel to a situation that is already conflictual. So, and therefore, cooperation is, for me, perhaps not the ideal, but it's a pragmatic way of approaching the ideal. This is Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Mading Or. Our guest is Dr. Francis Mading Deng, a renowned diplomat and a scholar. We now talk about sovereignty as responsibility as it relates to our country, the Republic of South Sudan newly born and going through a lot of challenges. So what would be sovereignty as responsibility in our context? Well, several principles are applicable. Number one, South Sudan is a country that for a long time, even before the independence of Sudan, was neglected. During the whole period of the independence United Sudan, South Sudan was a war zone, destroyed. And therefore, when South Sudan became independent, which incidentally was unexpected because people were prepared for a prolonged war, protracted conflict, the negotiations that led to the peace agreement was the result of international pressure on both sides. So you could say independence came uh, almost suddenly as a result of these pressures. So it found a country that was devastated, that had nothing to build on. And the crises that occurred are a combination of factors. Unfinished job in the relations between the two countries, conflicts that were spilling over the borders, uh, internal challenges, uh, lack of resource and capacity to manage a tough situation. And therefore, in a sense, what happened in South Sudan was what you might call self-fulfilling prophecy, which many people were warning against, not because uh, it was unavoidable, but partly because the structural problems that were uh, already there were hinting or indicating that now. That being the case, I alluded earlier. What was the prophecy? The prophecy was South Sudan would be a failed state. South Sudan would be afflicted by internal conflicts. South Sudan would be a crisis that would affect not only South Sudan, but the region. Some of us argued very strongly against it, saying, why would it happen? Why would South Sudan be a failed state? What are the internal challenges? If we know them, how do we prevent them? And we know, as I said in my latest book, Sudan and South Sudan continue to be bound by conflict, which means there are issues that are not resolved. Some of them actually uh, are issues that have continued to fuel internal conflicts, which is why I say that unless the two countries, maybe this is a side issue, but unless the two countries help one another to resolve their internal conflicts, their relations would never be absolutely normal. The same way, if they manage to work together closely, turn confrontation into cooperation, they will resolve internal conflicts and their relations would be much better. So the country found itself in crisis for a number of reasons. The international community, and this is important, had a lot of goodwill. Let me just point out that when South Sudan was born, South Sudan policies, or South Sudan was much more congenial to what we would call our friends, the UN, the United States. So what happened to this goodwill? Well, that's the point is, and again, I was very much 
part of that goodwill that I witnessed closely. That goodwill, the Secretary General formed a small committee of people to advise him. And although that was not my mandate, because I was dealing with genocide, I was a member of that group. And he would say, South Sudan would be his number one priority in the world. In a positive way. In a positive way, that he would give special attention. And in a wide variety of areas, almost comprehensive approach. UNMIS was supposed to be an institutionalized way of responding to the needs of the country. Now, countries like the United States were also very strongly pro-South Sudan. They really worked hard for South Sudan to become independent. Individuals who later on became seen as antagonistic were in the four, there were forerunners in support of the South. What happened then was when we began to have crises, the international community reacted in a manner that, to me, fell short of the uh, positive attitude they had had. For instance, they began to shift support to South Sudan into the humanitarian areas and protection of UN uh, peacekeepers. Fine. But they withdrew capacity building on the wrong assumption that building the capacity of a country will strengthen it to be pursuing the conflict and oppressive. Are we talking about the 2013 war, the crisis? Right, yeah. Now, that crisis began to create a situation where the international community, which had had very positive expectations, felt let down. They felt some of our best friends felt betrayed by the crisis. We also began to see these friends taking positions in the Security Council in a manner that contrasted with the image we had of them as friends. And so the irony is people who had stood for the South, for South Sudan, people who had been good friends of South Sudan, began to appear as though they were antagonistic to South Sudan. People who had not been such good friends emerged as though they were our friends. In the Security Council, those who sponsored negative resolutions towards South Sudan were our former friends. Those who supported us were those who were not such good friends. And you found, and yourself, began, you found yourself in the middle with international credibility, someone who has argued uh, for what has popularly become responsibility to protect. Now you found yourself in the middle trying to mediate between uh, the government on the extreme end and the international community. How was it for you? Well, that is the, uh, that to me is the serious uh, dilemma and, and, and paradoxical situation in that our country began to feel that we were being let down by friends and began to be antagonistic to the international community. The international community, including our friends, began to be very critical of us. The issue became a confrontation between what was increasingly seen as a hostile international community and our domestic agenda, including popular feeling about the international community being hostile to us. Now, my view was, how do we turn the crisis into an opportunity? How do we make those friends and those who were concerned with South Sudan, even though they were not friends, say, look, we appreciate the fact that you are concerned with what's happening to our country. You, we appreciate your concern about human rights violations, about the humanitarian situation. But so are we. We are concerned about our people. In fact, we welcome the fact that you want to help us, but let's do it together. You help us help our people. If you think we cannot do it well, for one or two or three reasons, show us what these reasons are so that we address it together. You explain that and what was the reception? It was a situation where some people within the Security Council, people listened and people appreciated the desire to be constructive. But at the same time, they would point out, but what is happening in your country is this and that and that. Help us help you. And our people were also feeling that these people were not really being genuine in helping us. Because if they say they care more about our people than our own leaders, that's very offensive 
for a foreigner to say that he cares more about your people than you. That's very offensive. At the same time, I want to challenge them. If you really care about my people the way you do, and I am there responsible for my people, how do we work together to address that issue? We don't help the people by being antagonistic, by your threatening to intervene or imposing sanctions on people you need to bring peace or cutting up uh, you know, arms embargo on a state that has a responsibility for maintaining the sovereignty of its country and protecting its own people. You, you, don't, you don't solve our problems right. with this negative attitude. Right. Let us find a common ground to work together. The 2013 war, as we understood it in South Sudan, was a power struggle within the SPLM, and it uh, spilled over uh, into a humanitarian crisis and also killed hundreds, uh, thousands of people. So what about the war that um, outraged the international community? Is it the fact that uh, after fighting for 20 painful years of liberation, we turn against ourselves. Is that the part that dropped the mat, or was there any other issue? You know, we assume that people know, but people's ability to know are constrained by a number of factors. If you are an outsider watching crises, watching people dying, getting killed, very often you react in a very spontaneous way. You just want to end the war. You want to. Uh, provide humanitarian assistance, you want to punish those who may be responsible and all that and that. Uh, again, it's, it might even be cultural because if you take African jurisprudence, my approach to African jurisprudence is that the settlement of disputes aim at consensus, reconciliation, moving forward together. The Western jurisprudential system is more adversarial, not cooperative, which means you go to court, rights and wrongs are determined, somebody is giving their rights, others are punished or whatever, you go your separate ways. And for us, the concept of trying to find a common ground to reunify, to reconcile, and to move forward as one nation is part of our culture. And we have seen, even in the Sudan, the wars we have fought in the Sudan, they would end up with a peace settlement in which people forgive and go forward. The same thing in our tribal conflicts, tribal wars. People kill one another, people get back together, compensation is paid, people are blessed. Look at Vietpi, to be sprayed with water of blessing and to go together to live in a community. That was not the case with the this, international system. The, the, no. And now we are confronted with these competing visions. Those who are eager to condemn what has happened simplistically without getting deep into why it happened, what conditions led to it, therefore how do we address those conditions? And those who see this external intervention as unwelcome violation of our sovereignty. And therefore we get confrontational in a manner that just aggravates matters. For instance, I began to say earlier, capacity building was a very important component of international assistance to South Sudan. When the conflict erupted, they shifted. Their priorities changed. Capacity building was removed. And I kept telling them, capacity building was not to strengthen the government to be oppressive. It was to strengthen the government to be responsible and effective in managing the situation. If you pull out capacity building projects, you're making it worse. You're reducing the ability of the government to manage the crisis. And so please, direct the kind of capacity building that you think is safe, but don't remove it altogether. Some of them would agree, some of them would even want to come back and try to help with capacity building. Our people, on the other hand, became so antagonistic against this attitude of the international community that we lose sight of the fact that these were yesterday our friends. Why are they suddenly our enemies? What is turning them into that? Is it for love of our opposition? Is it for love of 
or hostility to us or other conditions that we can discuss. One of the conditions is that the UN has taken a robust role in our affairs. Sometimes they meddled in our affairs. So uh, in light of that, um, how do we then reach that partnership when there is hostility on both sides? The UN, as we know, came on the eve of our independence. So UNMIS, you know, uh, and UNMIS now has a sweeping mandate to bring in attack helicopters, drones, and more tanks, and more tanks. So, and millions of South Sudanese have been uh, protesting, saying we don't want more UN troops. Now they are talking about bringing in a force to protect. And this goes directly to the core of your idea. So how do you feel about that idea being used possibly against the interests of South Sudan? Well, first of all, when I used to come and I would meet with the special representative, Secretary General, then I would meet with our people. There was something called a committee for uh, uh, the National Committee for Aliens, which was a high level committee formed of undersecretaries, I think chaired or co-chaired by Foreign Affairs and, and Interior. And listening to them, they had a lot of grievances against UNMIS and UNMIS's abuse of the SOFA uh, terms. Status of forces agreement. Right. Now, then I would go to the UNMIS. They would also list to me their concerns. And I would then tell UNMIS, these are the concerns I have heard from our people. Have you discussed them with them? And they would say, well, we know about 60% of what they told you. Well, what about the 40%? In other words, the dialogue was not adequate. There were gaps in the communication system. You know, I published a book which I called Talking It Out, Stories in Negotiating Human Relations. To me, if you talk, you discuss matters on the assumption that you are exploring a common ground, that's better than insulting one another and shouting from a distance. Now, the responsibility to protect, as you say, being used whether in intervening in Libya or in Iraq or now threats to come here, that this is based on the responsibility to protect, that is one component of the responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect, if you take it as an extension of sovereignty as responsibility, has those three pillars, state responsibility, support for the state, and only in the extreme case of failure, you go to the third pillar. Okay, let's assume that we have gone to the third pillar and that the international community has decided to send in a force, uh, a protection force. That is being done through the yeah. UN. Okay, now, protection force. You're coming to protect whom? Protect my people. What do you think I'm doing? I'm protecting my people too. I'm trying to protect my people. If you want to come to protect my people, that means we have a common interest, common interest in protecting our people. How do we do that? How do you come in to reinforce my capacity to be more effective in protecting my people rather than threaten as though you're coming to substitute me and you become the force to protect people? It won't happen because any country that has any semblance of independence and self-respect will have people who would resist. So. You're trying to stop the conflict. You add another conflict because their coming unwelcome would generate a conflict and therefore another confrontation, a layer of conflict over a layer of conflict. Whereas, if we do it in good faith, that we have a common goal, help us, A, address the crisis so that we foster the peace process and to end the conflict in an amicable, agreeable way, help us provide protection in the meantime, help us provide resources for the basic needs of our people, help us institutionalize a system of good governance uh, that will prevent future conflicts and stabilize the situation for the future. Let us explore the common ground. 
and the common ground. Let's end in this note. Uh, let's reconcile the fact that our independence was driven in large part, uh, was driven by the fact that we wanted to be our own people. We wanted self-reliance. And now we are talking about being dependent, and we have largely become a dependent society on the international community. So how do we strike the balance between uh, cooperation and self-reliance? What you mentioned as the objectives of the struggle is part of the story. Our struggle was to liberate ourselves from domination, to become free, to enjoy equal rights as citizens, to enjoy the, all the human rights, the dignity of the human being. It was, in many ways, fighting for certain ideals. Those ideals should guide us in developing our country. If for objective reasons, reasons beyond our control, we get distracted by conflicts that obviously we did not fight for, as the president said in his last statement or about uh, national dialogue, he said, I and my colleagues did not fight in order to tear this country apart. We fought for the dignity of this country, for freedom from a domination for liberty. These are some of the ideals that should guide us in addressing the problems that now tear us apart. Because we all were yearning for a country that would contrast with the country we left behind. How do we reset the button so that our former friends uh, come around to support us? You know, I used to tell people that it took Malcolm X and Martin Luther King combined for the American people to give attention to the cause of the African Americans. Violence and nonviolence. Yeah, it is true that some of us will use different methods. I may choose a method that is constructively engaging the, the other side. Somebody might choose to point out what is wrong with the way we are being treated. But whether we shout out loud against our adversaries or engage them constructively and quietly, let us at least know that we, there's a common ground, there's a common goal, and that we're working towards a common goal, and see how we synergize, how we reinforce one another, rather than be seen as just negative on the outside world because we see them as threatening intervention. First of all, they are wrong in threatening intervention, and it will never work. They can never, imp no army is going to come in and impose its will on South Sudan. In the end, it would have to be negotiated, negotiated in a way that explores the common ground. So maybe let us complain against certain treatment, let us engage also, but ultimately let our goal be how we co-opt those who are negative to become positive and work with us. Part of the responsibility of the government is to ensure that there is peace in the country. And you have just mentioned about uh, the national dialogue, which the president has been talked about and has stabbed you as one of the advisors, your view of the national dialogue. Well, first of all, uh, uh, even as advisors, we are going to work as a team or as a steering committee. And it's a process that is going to involve many people with different perspectives that will feed into the whole thing. But I see at least three or four faces of it, which are also built into the president's uh, statement. Let us begin with the fact that the president has repeatedly stated the goal of national dialogue as a very sincere national commitment to ending conflict and finding a stable, peaceful situ uh, approach to our problems in an ongoing, sustainable manner. So the intention has been very state, uh, stated very clearly. This leads to the next issue, uh, and that is working to end the current violence, and that means primarily engaging the parties that are engaged in this war that is devastating the country. Another level is 
the intercommunal conflicts that seem to be erupting as byproducts of this conflict. But I think there is an even longer term sustainable process of dialogue which will be continuing to help the country heal its various ailments at all levels. And for me, there's yet another level, and that is our system of governance has been based on external concepts, external constitutionalism that the colonial powers handed to us at independence, which they had not even practiced because they were very authoritarian and dictatorial. At independence, they had these Western type constitutions given to us to guide us, which had no roots on our realities and the way our societies were constructed and the cultural values behind the system. I think it's a challenge for us to build on the existing organizational structures of our people from the grassroots up. Anthropologists have studied our people in great depth. They are acephalous societies, autonomous societies, where everybody thinks is as good as anybody. Every unit, family, tribe, what have you, is equal to everybody else. This is an inherently democratic culture. But it poses a challenge because it makes it very difficult to govern. You know, why are you the leader and not me? Right, and there has been a debate so far whether to uh, pursue a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach. Those who talk about a bottom-up uh, up approach, they say there are problems at the grassroots that need to be listened to. And the top-down approach suggests that the conflict is started at the leadership level. Therefore, let's start at the leadership level and let's go down uh, to the grassroots. Which one do you favor? But what I'm saying is exactly that these are not either or approaches. Yes, there are conflicts that will need immediate attention to the warring factions to put down their arms and bring peace. There are intercommunal conflicts at the county or state or community level going down to payams and boomers uh, that need to be addressed. But I'm saying there is even more to the grassroots up, and that is how we build on the social structures of our societies, how we build self-governing, self-reliant communities uh, that can make the best use of their cultural values and organizational structures and institutions that we have not made use of. Now, I hear from a number of people that some of the things that are still working today are how our traditional systems are still intact and providing at the grassroots level a certain measure of peace and security and stability under the leadership of our uh, traditional leaders. Let us see how we can strengthen these and build them up. Now, the grassroots approach and the top up obviously are aiming towards the same thing of bringing comprehensive peace, unity, and stability to the country. They I don't can, see them as opposed. They can happen simultaneously. Absolutely. But then there's one last point, and that is how we relate to the outside world to help us in achieving and consolidating what we are doing at home. And it begins with some of our neighbors, like Sudan. We can either be negative influence on one another, or we can be partners in helping one another solve our internal problems in order to foster our regional cooperation that can then expand to our neighbors in the region and we become a force not only for our domestic peace and stability but also for the peace and stability of the region. There is a precedent in South Sudan of uh, dialogue initiatives and UNLIT is often mentioned as one of the best uh, do you agree that is the model we must follow, or there is some Unlit criticism? is often mentioned, and when it took place, uh, we had those who were directly involved, touring the international community, including the United States, presenting what they had done. I had mixed feelings about that. On the one hand, it was a good example of how communities can solve their problems, and that is in line with what our people used to do traditionally. Not only was the leader, the chief, a mediator and peacemaker within his community, but the different tribes had 
periodic meetings of their chiefs to solve problems between them or among them and all that. that. This is traditional. Why I felt ambivalent about it is that it was being used as a means for soliciting external support. And it was being means, funded from the outside. And it was becoming funded. Which means even more of these initiatives, we look to the outside world for more support. To me, I found that while it was positive that it happened, it was also being undermined by external dependency. These are things our people have done for generations, for centuries. We need to reinforce them, but we cannot begin to look to the outside world to make us do what we have been doing. Because if we don't get the outside world support, it means we incapacitate ourselves to do what we are able to do. And what lesson can be uh, drawn from that uh, when we talk about the current National Dialogue Initiative? I don't think we have given sufficient attention to understanding ourselves, understanding we are all aware of who we are with our identities. We are aware of the pride of our people. We are aware of the fact that this is a society where people are egalitarian, where people have a certain kind of, you might even call it chauvinistic pride in their ethnic group. We do not know fully how to make good use of our existing traditional, institutional, organizational structures to reinforce modernization, to see development as a self-enhancement from within, to see how we link our traditional values and cultural institutional structures with the process of modernizing from within. There are some countries that are doing it, that are building on what they are. But to, for us to adopt concepts, external concepts, and expect them to succeed without relating them to the ground, to me, that is missing a lot. That is a tremendous resource for building the nation. Dr. Francis Deng, thanks for coming to Fixing South Sudan. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.